Hi, what's up everybody? It's your boy, Raj Former on the internet, also known as Raj McCorning. Uh, I just wanted to open up this interview before it actually uh, legitimately starts to address some issues that the video actually has. Uh, Aiden Price, who is the amazing guest on this episode of the interviews, uh, is in China. So inherently there's going to be some lag there and it does feed into the interview a tad bit. You're going to notice me asking a question and then you, maybe I'm looking at the camera uh, or his screen at least and I notice that he's like he just gets the question or whatever and then there's a little bit of a pause a little bit of delay sometimes he wants to interrupt something and he starts doing it and then it's since there's a delay there is some awkwardness there none of it's his fault none of it's my fault at least as much as I can uh, take credit for it's all pretty much in the Google Hangouts delay so I just want to put that out there also this was filmed July 3rd hopefully you like it all the stuff is in the description down below if you want to go check out Lost Sea and Aiden's Twitter and stuff <laughs> Hey, what is up, everybody? Welcome back to the channel. I'm your host for today, Roger Picordi, also known as that Roger Former on the internet. Today, another interview. I'm sitting down with Aiden Price, not Aiden Pierce of Watch Dogs, Aiden Price, <laughs> uh, over at East Asia Hello. Software, uh, Soft, um, in Hong Kong, China. Jeez, Louise. That's far. Mm -hmm. you're, the, you're the future. 12 hours ahead. It's July 4th over there. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and Independence Day. Yeah, Independence Day in the U.S. Um, and you're creating Lost Sea. I'm playing it a ton. So yeah, thanks for coming on. How you doing? No worries. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, anytime. Um, so yeah, I've been, so you gave me a code for this game. Playing it a ton. I mm -hmm. like it a lot. And I want to get into what this game is about. I want to tell what you're talking about. But first, I want the viewers to understand who you are as a person, your background. Tell us a little bit about your uh, development um, history with video games and um, how it's led you to move to China and make a video game about, uh, you know, killing monsters in, in, the, <laughs> in the Bermuda Triangle. <laughs> okay. Um, so I got started in game development about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, it was just something that I really wanted to get into. So after university, I decided to um, give myself a year, basically, and you know, right, I'm going to spend this year, I'm going to try and get into game development. Mm. So during that time, I managed to get some entry-level positions as uh, like a tester for EA working on stuff like Battlefield, Bad Company, and also a small indie publisher mm -hmm. um, working on titles like Penumbra. And then after that, I just moved to uh, a slightly bigger company here in the UK called Stainless Games, who I guess the, the thing they're most famous for is Carmageddon and the Magic the Gathering um, Jewels of the Planeswalker games. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a really good time there, spent a couple of years there, and I realized that I really wanted to get some more AAA experience. So I went to Splash Damage for a while, and I worked on Brink. Um, and then during during that time, uh, my wife got offered a, a really good opportunity in Hong Kong. Um, and it was sort of coming to the end of the project on Brink, so I thought, you know, it was a good opportunity to try something new. And um, the iPad had just come out, like mobile was getting really big. And I thought, oh, you know, this is a really good opportunity to sort of be at the, you know, the front of mobile development because yeah, it seemed to be yeah. very much blowing up over there. Um, and after working in mobile for <laughs> a good couple of years, I realized I didn't really like it very much. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's fine. Like, you know, there's definitely mobile games that I enjoy, um, yeah. but just a lot of them were very uh, sort of like derivative, you know, like reskins of existing stuff. And yeah. I realized that my passion really lay in console games. So when I first came here, there wasn't really much of like a development scene like there was in the UK. So I started organizing these monthly meetups for game developers. Mm -hmm. And that's how I hooked up with the East Asia soft guys. Uh, and when I found out that they wanted to make a PS4 and Xbox One and Steam game here in Hong Kong, I was like, I just leapt to the chance basically. I was like, yes, I have to do that. So yep. that's pretty much it. That's awesome. Um, that that's really cool. I like that. I like you have a very uh, different. Uh, it's pulling from different AAA, indie, all that stuff. I like that. mobile, 
that's something that I don't really yeah. know much. Yeah. Um, so you've, you've had a taste from a little bit of everything. And Lossy, I want you to give the pitch. Yeah. Tell me what this game is for people mm-hmm. that, don't, that don't know what it is. Because uh, it's very unique. I like it a lot. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the way that we describe it is uh, mm-hmm. an explorative action-adventure game. So the central premise is that you've been stranded in the Bermuda Triangle and you have to escape. And the way that you do that is you navigate through procedurally generated islands mm-hmm. um, and along the way you find different crew members and the crew have got different skills and abilities and it's about managing their abilities to help you achieve your goals and ultimately help you escape uh, the island and um, it's got permadeath elements as well so if you die or your crew die um, it's over basically and we because we wanted to try and we wanted to try and give the player like difficult decisions to make and permadeath is a really good way of doing that yeah um and that, that's something that i was thinking about and it works very well um I, there's been many a time when i'm playing this game and i have no revives and i'm just screwed and it gets really <laughs> intense um how do you balance that because that's like something that is is very hard especially I, I at least in my opinion uh to see a lot of people that they have these permadeath mecha- mechanics but not make it feel cheap like how was that balancing in, in the development of that game yeah yeah, um, I mean, so the way that I normally do it, um, and it sort of ties into the balancing of everything in Lost Sea from the upgrade uh, costs and, you know, the you know the critter stats and things like that. So the first, the first point is just playing the game a lot, right? And you start to get a feel for how things should be, you know, like this, this critter shouldn't kill me in two hits, you know, two hits is... Uh, he's too powerful, so is four a good number? And you just start very roughly balancing it out like that. And then once you feel that you've got it to a pretty solid first pass, then it's really important to start trying to get feedback. So, for instance, we went to the uh, PlayStation Experience last year and PAX Australia the year before that, and shows like that are great because they let you really uh, test your assumptions. Normally, what, what normally you find is that it's a lot harder for players than it is for developers. So as a general rule, if it's a little bit too easy for you, then that's about right. Um, and you know, you get people's feedback and input and things like that. Um, and then it, you can also do a bit to try and quantify it as well, basically. Mm-hmm. So um, you know, if, if people are playing the game and they can't get past the jungle zone, or they can't get past the third island, and you're like, okay, this is hard. Yeah. Um, no, and you mentioned PSX. That was going to be one of my questions. Um, mm. That is something that is so interesting to me. I've had developers on that were talked about. They go to PSX, and that changes the entire look of their game and how they how it plays because that is such a hardcore audience. Like that's the audience that is going to buy your game. Yeah. So, like, how was that experience? And what maybe specifically did you have to change um, with the game in terms of the feedback? Yeah, um, like you say, it's pretty full on because it's uh, like two or three day event in the case of PAX, and um, you just have constant traffic, like constant traffic to the booth. So, you know, just doing some napkin maths, and you realize that like thousands of people get hands on with the game over the weekend, mm. um, and because your attention is sort of pulled in a lot of different directions, you know, it's like you might have. Um, sort of YouTubers and press coming by and you're sort of chatting to them. You're also trying to keep one eye on people playing the game at the same time. So you've just got to try and take as much information as possible. So I just normally had like a notepad, just like scribbling notes down. Um, in particular, um, just a lot of the, the critter behavior, um, you know, just tuning that so that it, uh, for instance, like there's, I don't know if you've seen like the little dinosaur, he sort of charges yeah. at you. Yeah. Um, I, I know it very just, well. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so like he used to be even faster, like he used to give the player even less time. Wow. And you can see people getting constantly like nailed by this guy. So you, you just say, okay, right, we need to increase the delay before he charges. We need to, you know, reduce this, the charge speed, things like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, 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 that's, a, that's an enemy that... Um... 
it's got me more than a few times. Um, but yeah, I, I do see how, <laughs> how you guys make the animation very clear, and that I could I could totally see how that is something that you took from PSX and stuff like that. And um, this game is procedural. Um, how mm -hmm. how is that development? Like that's like that's just to me blows my mind. Every time I see a, a procedural game, uh, a game that creates itself randomly or whatever. Um, how, just how was that? How did you take another? Because your approach is a little bit different. Instead of creating like fully, you guys kind of take this these ideas and you rework them in um, these different roles randomly. Um, so how was that for you guys? Yeah, um, I think you know, depending on the type of game you make, um, it's a different challenge for everyone. So when we knew we wanted to have procedural elements, the first thing we sat down, uh, the first thing we did was like sit down and look at the different ways that people. Would potentially tackle that problem yeah and a very common one is to create a sort of terrain out of a noise map mm -hmm. and we realized that wasn't going to work for us because we have a lot of interaction with uh, crew members for instance and they need to be able to run up and like fix a bridge and things like that so we, we realized very early on that we needed to have a bit more of a constrained environment so we had to make sure that if a bridge spawned um, it always had to be like you know, this far away from the edge of the cliff and things gotcha. like that. Yeah. So the inspiration for it was um, a lot of older board games. Uh, I don't know if you remember stuff like Warhammer Quest, like these old dungeon crawling board games. Mm. But essentially what it is, is the dungeon is created from prefabricated tiles, which give you the layout of the room. They give you the general size and shape and layout of the room. And then all of the content inside is randomized. So like the monsters in there, the loot in there, um, you know, the mission objectives are scattered around the rooms. So that was the direction that we we sort of decided to go in. Mm. Yeah, and it um it, it works. Um, I think that it's you're always going through like, oh yeah, I know this area or whatever, and then you're like, oh, I've never seen that plane over there. Like it, it's it has enough there where there is some randomization, and you're like, oh yeah, I haven't seen that before. Um, one of the things I found very unique about this game that there's boss there's a boss battle at the ending of each of the um, mm -hmm. at the ending of the warps or whatever. Um, you know what? Why, why did you guys feel compelled to put that in there um, as like the ending of it? Because usually it's just like okay, four, then move on to the next one. Why? Why do you feel like okay, a boss battle needs to be here? Yeah, we. That's actually something uh, you talked about feedback mm -hmm. as a result of PSX, but that's actually something that we wanted to get in before PSX because um, we found that game progression there wasn't really much of a fanfare when you move between zones yeah you know you finish the jungle zone like and then boom you're straight into the desert zone it didn't really have any sort of sense of you know there wasn't any sort of like big climactic battle at the end yeah conclusion. so we wanted to have it yeah exactly so we wanted to just have something um that was a little bit more of a challenge um at the end of the zone, and it also served as like a good bookend between moving to the next zone. It's like, okay, kill the kill the boss. Um, then that way we can give the player like a, a few more resources, like as a reward for being the boss, and then it gives them a bit of a leg up when they're going into a new zone that they've not experienced before. Yeah, um, yeah, that's that works very well. Um, and my favorite thing is that the ending of the boss battle, you pick up that tablet, it's a different color, and you're like, oh, go to another warp zone, exciting. Uh, yeah. talk, about the, talk about the idea for the tablets, because I like I quite like that. Um, mixing up the idea of like okay, I can get one and leave the island, or I can try to survive to get three and then get farther on. Um, you know, what, what what was the idea behind that too? So originally, instead mm -hmm. of collecting tablets, you would actually gather resources. So in order to fix your boat, you had to get like wood, uh, metal, screws, and it was a bit more. Um, almost a bit more like an RTS, right? You're gathering these resources. And then what we found was that there would always be one resource type that was the limiting factor. And in this particular case, it was screws, right? So you'd be running around an island and you'd have like 200 wood, you only need 50. You'd have like 200 metal, you'd only need 50. And you'd need three screws, but you'd only have one. <laughs> and it was just really frustrating. Yeah. So we were like, okay, so what happens if you only have to collect these two or three very rare items? Then we're like, okay, cool. So implemented that, and then we found it was still a little frustrating for the player because they'd have two of these tablets. 
uh, well, two of these screws it was originally. And then, you know, they're still looking for this third one. And, you know, people already have two. It feels like we're punish them, uh, punishing them unfairly because they can't find this third one. So we're like, instead of punishing the player for not collecting all of them, what about if we flip it and actually reward them for collecting more? Mm -hmm. So when we figured out, like, okay, what's this resource going to be? We, we then, you know, when we decided it was going to be like tablets, um, we thought, you know, if you collect more of them, it should give you more of a choice over what island to go to next. Uh, so that was, that was the logic behind it, really. Um, you know, just giving the player a bit more choice. So if they collect two tablets, they don't necessarily have to go to a hard island. They can choose to go to an easy one if they get if they roll that. Yeah, and like that. That's like one of the defining things about this game that I quite love is that, like, you get close to the boss and you're like, oh, I don't need to get three. I can just get two, and I should be good. And yeah, um, yeah it, it doesn't. It doesn't like. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't make me like it. Like, oh, I have to get this third one, and I'm oh, and then I die, and then you get mad. It's um, it's it's, it's about, again that balance is is very good in this game. Um, and, and oh, yeah. Thing, sorry, I was oh. the other thing as well is the more tablets that you get is um, when you die, you're actually rewarded for the tablets that you get. Yeah. Um, with like XP and coins. So if a player wants to take a little bit of time and explore and gather more tablets, um, then they'll be rewarded for it in the next, you know, in the next playthrough. Yeah, um, it's it's like a it's like a safe haven. It's like okay, well, you yeah, okay, good. Even if I die, I still I get some money um, at the ending. And yeah, so <laughs> the day and night cycle. That's something that I, I want to know, like the thought behind, um, because it's it's it adds something to the environment. Um, you know, what, why why did you guys feel like okay, we need to add a day and night cycle to this? Hmm. Um, so originally. Mm -hmm. There was going to be a lot more. Uh, there's going to be a lot fewer critters, but they were going to have a lot more AI. Uh, they were going to have like a lot more um, routines going on. So you know, at night time they'd move to different areas and things like that. And it just it just wasn't really very much fun, um, essentially because it just it just you'd get an island that just didn't have many enemies. Um, and then, you know, at night time, you just get killed. So similar to the tablets, we were like, okay, this isn't working. So what about if we have an island and it's got a population, and then at night time, it spawns, like, special night monsters, and special night monsters are just, like, very weak, but they come at you from, like, the bushes, and they just charge at you. And so we got that in, and then we found that that wasn't very much fun either because what you're basically doing is at night time, if you're trapped, uh, if you're out in the island and you can't make it back to the boat before night hits, you have to basically run into a corner and just put your back to the wall and just try and survive. And it just felt we were punishing the player so unfairly. It's like, cool, good job on collecting the tablets. Like, I sure hope you don't die. Um, so yeah, we decided to uh, we decided to get rid of that. Like, that coat's actually still in there. Um, it was something that we were going back and forth on um, until quite late in development. Um, but yeah, that was the sort of logic behind the day-night cycle. Is that fireworks? Yeah, it's okay, guys. I just want to put this out there. I, I told them before, fireworks, not gunshots. It's July, 3rd. <laughs> it's July third right now. My brother's like, yeah. oh yeah, just throw fireworks because that's the thing you do on July third, not Independence Day, July third. All right. Um, no, yeah, that that makes a ton of sense because I was wondering, I was like, oh, are these enemies harder? Like, what's? Oh, okay, and that that makes a lot of sense adding it to it. But it does add something, at least to the environment, uh, even if the enemies aren't hiding in bushes and making you hide in a corner. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So um, I want to talk about the inspirations because in your developer mm. bio, you talk you love of Spelunky. I feel a lot Spelunky in this. Yeah, I, I feel that a lot. Um, and so what were the inspirations behind this game and maybe you personally in the development of, of this game? Bossy. Yeah. Um, so we, when we first started development, we knew that there were certain things that we wanted to do. Um, mm -hmm. We sort of identified the constraints that we had as the studio. And one of them was, you know, we're a very small team. So we definitely can't compete with people like um, Ubisoft, you know, we just we can't make the amount of content that you get in an Assassin's Creed. So yeah. procedural generation is a, a big win for a lot of smaller studios because you do the work up front and then 
it creates potentially like limitless content at the back end. Like you have to do, you know, quite a lot of work up front, um, but it is definitely worth it. Um, so that was one of the inspirations. The other one was very early on, we knew that we wanted to make like a bright and colorful game. Um, and, you know, it's just the type of games that we grew up playing and it's just something that we really love. And um, it's not really an art style you see so much of. I mean, it's a lot better now because you've got stuff like ukulele yeah. and uh, things like that, which which I'm really excited to see. Um, but in terms of like the, the sort of Spelunky style inspiration, that was, um, the permadeath wasn't actually something that went on in until quite late in development. Mm -hmm. Like we always had, uh, permadeath on crew um, because we wanted to treat them like the way that we described them was like living gear right so in Zelda you get the hookshot but our logic was what happens if this guy has the hookshot and once he's dead you can't use it so um, it, it was more a case of we had an idea for how we wanted the game to play and then just sort of iterating it on it over time and taking it to trade shows and getting feedback and things like that. Um, took it in more of a, more of like that sort of permadeath direction. Whereas before it was gonna be a bit more of like a slower paced gathering experience. Almost almost a bit more like don't starve initially. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, the more we implemented and the more we tested and the more feedback we got, we sort of moved a little bit away from that direction. Wow, that's interesting. Um, cause that's such a major thing about the game um, that 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 the environment and the people that were playing the game inf affected this game so much. That's 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 actually very very interesting. Um, you mentioned. Think, oh yeah. Sorry. I, think, sorry. Uh, I think it's something that's um, one of the benefits of being like a smaller developer as well is you know you're not you're not locked into this stuff. If you take it to a trade show, uh, you get a lot of feedback from people. You've got the freedom to make those changes, right? You're not, you're not sort of beholden to like, you know, board members or you know, there's not like a hierarchy or like a marketing plan already in place. So that's one of the great things about being a smaller developer is you've got that sort of freedom. Yeah, and yeah, that, that's very true. Uh, if you're a Ubisoft or whatever, as you mentioned, even though you can make this massive world, if someone's like, "Hey, I don't like this key feature of the game," you can't do much with it. Um, so yeah, yeah. That, that, that's. That is a very good way to look at it. You're a very positive person, Aiden. <laughs> um, and I want to talk a little bit about uh, the followers. You talked about how they were um, always like this, per this type of people that would follow you and add the ability onto you, and if they die, they're dead. Um, did they ever fight? Mm. Because sometimes I'm just like, you guys are in the corner. You guys got to fight. You guys got to do something. You got to earn your keep. <laughs> no, um, they've never been like active in combat. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, again, we, we sort of iterated on a couple of uh, ways. Uh, well, we, we went through a couple of iterations with the crew members. So we used to actually have a button where you tell them to stop and then you tap the button a second time and then you sort of pull them back to you, like almost like stay and then follow, stay and follow. Mm -hmm. and what we found is that you were basically just tapping that button all the time because you're like, stay, go kill the monsters okay, monsters are dead, now follow. And it was just like busy work for the player. Yeah. So we actually automated that. Um, and very, very early on, the crew used to be able to explore the island independently. You used to be able to send them out and say, hey, go find a chest. And he'd go find a chest and then he'd bring stuff back to you or go find a shipwreck. And what we found was, it's not on RTS, right? You, you can't see all of the map at the same time. So people would send a crew member off. He'd die. They'd have no idea why. And they'd be really like, oh, what the hell? Yeah. Or, you know, you'd send him off and then you'd get on the boat and sail away. And then, you know, they'd lose pot potentially like they're the best member of their crew. So, Yeah. Um, interesting. Yeah, because these AI members, um, I get very excited when I get the revive. Just want, I just want to put that out there. Yeah. yeah. That's a, that's a very yeah. that's a very solid <laughs> choice that you guys put in there. Um, that makes me very very happy. It's just the word. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I I think that's it. Um, I I just want to reiterate, let you pitch it. The game's coming out July fifth. Um, on right, yeah. yeah, on Steam, uh, PS4, and Xbox One. Yep. Xbox One should be live now. Oh wow. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Pick it up. 
Um, no, that's all right. It's um, yeah, it went uh, it went up a few days before the uh, before the PlayStation and Steam versions. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, no, yeah, I, I'm I'm I excited to see what people think of the game. Um, all the links, of course, are in the description below. Your Twitter, Aiden, is in the description below. So people can follow you, get that follower cool. count up. Um, everybody, <laughs> yeah. uh, everybody, go check out the game. It's very good, in my opinion. Don't know if I'll do a review, but yeah, this is this might count as one. Um, so yeah, thanks, so Aiden, for coming out and hanging out with me and talking about this game. Um, have a good day, everybody. Bye.